All right, great hymn. A young boy told his mom one time, he says, you know what God's name is? And he said, what? He said, Andy. Andy, why do you think God's name is Andy? Because the hymn says, Andy walked with us, Andy talked with us, amen? <laughs> so, ha, ha, ha. But uh, actually, he told me that joke in Israel, too, so, which is funny, my tour guide. I'm like, I've heard that before, but it eventually made its way to Israel. So it's been uh, 10 days, or over 10 days, and over 10,000 miles since I've seen y'all. So that's a long time. But I had a wonderful trip to Israel, and so what I thought I'd do today is talk about what I learned from my trip to Israel. Now, I've got over a thousand videos that we did, so I was hoping to show some videos today, but I just I couldn't get them. It took me a day and a half just to download them to the computer. So maybe next week, Lord willing, I might be able to bring some videos to show you of the trip. But today, what I want to do is just talk about what the Lord showed me, what I learned. So let's start in Psalms 106:48. Psalms chapter 106 and verse 48. And I learned a lot from my trip to Israel. And uh, I'm really blessed that one of my viewers, he's a doctor. Uh, Mark, you know who you are. I appreciate you, Mark. He paid for my trip over there. So that was a great blessing. And he has been to uh, different war zones and as a doctor to many different countries. And I didn't know what I was getting into. But do you all know that Israel really is at war? So I didn't realize that. So I wasn't scared or anything, but I just I didn't know what I was getting into. And I really got a little real while you're there, because before I went, I thought, hey, everything's hunky dory. But the more you heard stories of what happened over there, you in the back of your mind, you know, at any moment something could happen. And it's kind of um, sad to see that, that there are people that wish to harm other people. Isn't that horrible? And so you've got to be very careful if you do go to Israel because there could be some sort of potential terrorist attack. And thankfully, God protected us, and I think He protected us um, within minutes on some occasions of certain places. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But Psalms 106, verse 48, the Bible says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Praise you, the Lord. So let's say it. Amen. Amen. Praise you, the Lord. Amen. Amen. So um, what I learned in Israel, well, as we know, the one true God is the God of Israel. If you know your Old Testament, he chose of all the nations on earth, that nation, that nation of Israel. Why? I don't know. But some people, they think they have the answer to that. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But he chose Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He chose them. And that's the nation that it became. And it's amazing to see that that nation exists to this day. After almost 2,000 years, it's there again. Now, we're not going to debate on who the true Jews are. I don't know. All I know is God knows who they are, is what I believe. And I think they're there, but I'm, I don't know how to ask which one's the right one, which one's the wrong one. I, all I know is, okay, you say you're an Israeli, I'll take you at face value, I guess. Um, it was interesting to see that. But what I learned in Israel is, number one... Israel is pretty pricey. <laughs> um, I don't know. I hope I spelled pricey right. Uh, I don't know if I could have, you know, bought the ticket and gone over by myself. I'm appreciative, uh, again, appreciative for, you know, they're paying the ticket over there and everything. But it's, it's not a cheap country. Um, the price of a shekel to the dollar was 3.6 shekels to one U.S. dollar. That's the exchange rate. But I noticed that the meals, the hotels, the gas, all of it was a little more than what we're used to here. But I guess, you know, if we lived up north, it would be about the same, I guess, because prices are higher than where we live here on the Redneck Riviera, right? In Pensacola, if an atom bomb went off, it'd do us all a favor and do about $10 worth of damage and we could start all over again for pretty cheap. But uh, over there, I was just surprised at, at the prices of things, how expensive they were. Um, but also uh, I saw... How, how expensive it is to go to Israel, the price of a ticket, and how expensive it was to live there. And so that was a little strange. That caught me off guard. I didn't think it would be that expensive. But who knows? Maybe I just saw the tourist price. You know, whenever they see a tourist, the price is, and then the price for the person there is, is less. A lot of countries are like that. But it's a little pricey, but I do wish that you all could go as well. It is a great trip and it was definitely worth it. Now the tour guide said I need 20 people who want to go. So we could potentially, if you guys save up, do a trip. And he said if I get 20 people, he'd be our tour guide. So uh, that's something that we might can plan if the Lord tarries for another year or so. And uh, I mean, I don't want to lead the tour 
or anything, but it would be amazing to be able to go. I've had lots of emails from people that said, Brother Breaker, I would have gone with you. And so, but it is a little pricey. Now, the thing that was pretty amazing about Israel is the actual position. God knows what he's doing. And then the position of that country, where it is, I think God did that for a reason. And it's about the 30th parallel uh, where we are here in Pensacola. And so you draw a line on a, around the 30 or 31st parallel, it goes to Israel from what I, what I, so we're really kind of on the same parallel around the, if you believe it's a globe or if you just draw a straight line, however you want to look at that. But it's uh, pretty interesting that, that we're in ge geographically around the same, I think I'm saying it correctly, the, the longitude or whatever latitude, we're pretty close. And that's what shocked me. A lot of the plants were the same plants we have. I'm expecting to go see all different plants and trees and grasses and everything. And a lot of it was the stuff we got here. And we go to Joppa and, and uh, we're in the port city of Joppa where Peter saw the vision. And I look down and there's a bunch of mullet, just like I look down and see here in Florida. So even the same fish in a lot of cases. So that was pretty shocking. I, I learned that there are a lot of things. So I grew up as a kid fishing with my dad and catching mullet. And the thought just struck my head. Wow, that's how Peter grew up. And he grew up fishing, probably with his dad and catching some of the same fish. Now, there weren't any mullet in the, in the Sea of Galilee, but he went to Joppa and he probably would have caught some mullet and ate them over there. So, and yes, mullet are kosher, they told me. So you can eat a mullet if you're a Jew. But there's something about Israel, something about, and they've always said that it's the center of the world. And they have this old drawing from like the 1400s or something. And they have Israel here, Europe here, Asia here, and Africa here. And they called that something like the... The Israeli flower, I don't remember the name, something flower or something. But they've always looked at that place as the place to where you can reach all three places. And that's the place to go. So there must be something to that. There must be something to God wanting that. And if you look at 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 36, I don't think it was just by chance that people moved there. I believe God looked down from heaven and said, hey, that's, that's a place that I like. And that's the place that I want to be the center of everything. And in 1 Kings 11.36, the Bible says, And unto his son will I give one tribe, that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. So when you look at Jerusalem, that city is interesting. And we went to Jerusalem twice. We got to walk around. And by the way, in the Bible, it says they went up to Jerusalem. They went up to Jerusalem. They went, and I was just like, I don't know what that means. But you really drive way uphill to get to the mountains where Jerusalem are. And when you're in Jerusalem, man, you better be a mountain climber because none of the roads are flat. They go up, they go down. And whenever you want to go somewhere, you go down that road and that road, it's called the ascent because the road goes up to wherever you're going. It was just wild. I'm just like, man. Those, those uh, apostles must have had like the biggest huge legs because they're always going up all the time. But if you look at the city of Jerusalem, it's shaped like a shin or a sin or however that letter is. That's the last letter of the Hebrew language. And God said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. So that's the last letter. And there's three valleys that go through there. The Hinnom Valley, the Tyropian Valley, and the Kidron Valley. Well, we, we've all heard of the Kidron Valley because across the Kidron Valley over here was the Mount of Olives. So we started by coming to the Mount of Olives and looking down and seeing all of Jerusalem. And we saw the Dome of the Rock, which my tour guide called the Golden Pimple. <laughs> I was like, why do you call that? He goes, because it's about to pop. And I was like, oh, OK, because, you know, God's going to uh, well change that geography a little bit, if you will. But I thought that was funny how he called it that. But here's the Kidron Valley. Here's the Triopian Valley. Here's the Hinnom Valley. And we drove all the way around Jerusalem so we could see all the gates. And we drove over here and we saw the Hinnom, the Hinnom Valley. And I'm looking down. And it was very deep and there were cliffs on either side. And there was this huge tree just sticking up there on the side of the cliff. Do you know where Judas went? He hung himself right in that area. And just like I told you, when we went through our Bible study that he was by a cliff and people think that when the earthquake came, he fell. well, there was a tree right there and a big old cliff where he could have fallen down. So it's just, just like the Bible says, it's just amazing. So we see all these places and the tour guide's like, this happened there. And I'm just like, that's exactly how I pictured it in my head, looking just like that. And that's what it looked like. So that was fun to go and see Jerusalem. There's different mounts inside Jerusalem. 
And there's Mount Moriah. We got to see that. That's where the Temple Mount was. But also Mount Zion. And Mount Zion is a little bit north of the city of David. So David always look up to Mount Zion. And so when you read through the Psalms, how many times he says Mount Zion is exalted or Mount Zion on high and things like that. And he was just looking out his window and seeing this little tiny mountain right there in the middle of the city. But boy, was it overpopulated. I mean, there was just houses everywhere, everywhere. I just didn't expect to see that many houses everywhere. It just kind of was shocking that there's just so many people there. And it, there's, no, there's no quiet space, if you will. It's just so, so overpopulated, I guess. I mean, I, I hate to use that term, but it's, it's interesting. Oh, by the way, again, this is the, the final letter in Hebrew, the 21st letter, which would be what? 7 plus 7 plus 7. So that's kind of another 7. But that was fun to see the valleys and everything like that. So it was a little pricey to get there and the position of it. I think God has a reason that that's there. Well, another thing I saw and I thought about was the pilgrimages, the pilgrim. I hope I spell this right. The pilgrimages. There are so many people that want to go and see that. Why? Well, this that guy named Don McLean sang a song. The guy that sang American Pie, he sang a song called Jerusalem. Have you ever heard him sing that? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, all roads lead to you. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Muslim, Christian, Jew. So you've got Muslims, you've got Christians, you've got Jews, you've got all these people that something in that place is sacred to them. They want to go there. So there's a lot of people that want to go there. But over the last, well, with COVID, that was a problem. And then with what happened, well, I'll talk about that here in a minute on 10-7, there's been a lot less tourism. In fact, a lot of people got scared and canceled. And so a lot of the tour guys are, are suffering and, and they're hurting. They're having to go drive Uber stuff and do, because they're not getting the tourism that they used to. So there's a lot less people that are going. And what was interesting, it just so happened to work out. I didn't plan this, but I showed up on Purim, the Feast of Purim. And the day that we went to the Garden Tomb was the day that some call Easter. You know, I, you know the history of that. So. Even the guy that went with me, he goes, I don't say Easter, I call it Resurrection Day. Amen. All right, I don't have a problem if you call Easter, I know what you're talking about. But we just do remember that that comes from, you know. So Resurrection Day kind of sounds like a better word to use. But we were there on Easter or Resurrection Day at the tomb. So the very day that he would have risen is the day that we got to see it. So that, that just happened to work out. I just thought that was amazing. And um, again, I guess because that was that day, I was expecting there were a lot of people and there wasn't a lot of people. So part of it was because people are afraid of all the rockets and everything. But so many people go there that it's just incredible to see and how how blessed we were on our trip to go during the time when there was the least amount of people that had to be the Lord. Otherwise, we've been waiting in line everywhere. And if you're a Jew, let's go to Second Chronicles, chapter 36. If you're a Jew, they've set up the laws to help you if you're living in another country to come back to that country. And you can, if you're a Jew, go to Israel and you can make your pilgrimage, if you will. But you can go there and decide if you want to stay there because, well, that's supposed to be where the Jews are. Right. And so the last book in the Hebrew Bible is Second Chronicles. That's the last book of the Hebrew Bible. And the very last sentence of the Hebrew Bible, 2 Chronicles 36, 23 says, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth have the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. So the last thing in the Hebrew Bible is to the Jews saying, hey, go up. Go up to Jerusalem. Go back to Israel. Well, they call this, the Jews, the Aliyah. And this is Aliyah. And the Aliyah is your trip that you make to Israel. And, and you're deciding, well, am I want to move from my country and live there? And a lot of times they've already made up their mind. I don't care. I'm moving there. And they come and they say, I'm on Aliyah. That's what they call it. And, oh, you're on your Aliyah? And in the old days, they'd put them in a kibbutz. Kibbutz, kibbutz right? And a kibbutz was a little, almost like a little summer camp. And you had to be there something like nine months and you're learning Hebrew, you're learning all the laws of Israel, you're learning how to work and do all this stuff. And then you become a citizen. But a lot of people told me they came on their Aliyah and they just put them in a house. But either way, you've got to learn Hebrew. You've really got to learn Hebrew. And that's, uh, 
it's an interesting language to say the least. So it was pretty cool to see all these people, and again, go up to Jerusalem because you're going up. So another thing that was real cool that I learned was about all the places. And I went to so many places in Israel. I saw so much. Our tour guide literally took us from the north to the south. Let me show you the map here. And uh oh, hope this goes this direction. Yeah. Oh, we came into Tel Aviv and we went up and spent the night in Haifa. Ha Haifa is what they call it. And he took us up here to the border of Lebanon. He took us over here and we saw Syria. We could almost walk to Syria. We were so close. And then he took us all the way down here to So we literally went from one end to the other. The old saying is from Dan to, Bar Bar to, to Beersheba. Well, Dan is about here and Beersheba is down here. So we went even farther. We went from this border down to this border. So we got to see everything. And a lot of people, they, they don't know the map of Israel. But this is where Gaza is, where all the fighting was. There still kind of is, I guess. And over here is the Dead Sea. This is what they call the West Bank. And this is called the Golan Heights. And the West Bank is dangerous because that's under the control of a lot of the, um, the Muslims. And so we didn't get to go in there much. In fact, there was a knife attack the day before, and that kept us from going to Jericho. And I wanted to see the city of Jericho. So this is the map of, of Israel. And, you know, Lebanon, we saw Lebanon, we saw Syria. We come down here, we could see Saudi Arabia down there. We could see Egypt and we saw Jordan. So I literally got to see five different countries from Israel. And so that's just kind of a map of that. So you'll see what it looks like. And again, that, man, I don't know why it does that sometimes. Oh, and it hurts your fingers, but that's okay. Okay. So the places. So I literally went to a lot of places. Um, I saw Sodom, where Sodom was. And I wore the shoes that I had in Israel because I still have the dirt on it. So I'm stepping on Sodomites right now because I still have the dirt on my shoes. Isn't that funny? I saw Sodom. I saw the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias. I saw Mount Carmel, where Elijah was. I saw Caesarea, and I saw Caesarea Philippi. They're two different places. I saw the beach where Jesus saw Peter and cooked for the food and asked him three times, Do you love me? I saw the Valley of Armageddon. I saw the gates of hell at the town called Baneus. I saw Jerusalem. I saw Golgotha or Calvary, which they call Skull Hill. I saw Jesus' tomb. I saw the Red Sea, the Jordan, the wilderness of Zin. I saw Jaffa or Joppa and much, much more. And uh, I got to dip in five bodies of water while I was there. So I dipped my feet in the Jordan River. I swam in the Sea of Galilee. Um, I went to the Dead Sea and then the Red Sea. And what was the other one? I forget. But anyway, you can watch my shorts and you'll see what that other one was. Oh, the Mediterranean Sea. I got to dip my feet in the Mediterranean Sea. So it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was amazing. The places, even if you're not going there to see all these sites, it was a beautiful place. It was just a gorgeous place. And like I said, I don't ever want to go there. It's all desert. Who wants to go see a bunch of desert? Well, let's go to Isaiah 35 because... It wasn't all desert. Now, there was a lot of desert, <laughs> but they came in there and when they made that country, they figured out, I think it's called drip irrigation, and they were to turn the desert green. Now, down here is the Negev Desert, okay? So a lot of this is still pure desert, but all here used to be a lot of desert, but man, is it green now because they came in there and they planted and they used drip ir irrigation. In Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 1, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and bloom as the rose. And so it was pretty interesting to see so many green places, so many green places where there was once desert. Now it's blooming like a rose, just like the Bible says. So that was cool. That was cool. Now, I also saw in Israel and also learned more about the people. And um, most of the people were sweet. Most of the Israelis, I mean, they were awesome. Um, I mean, I, I felt like when I was in Jerusalem, like I was in New York City, kind of, but with nice people. Because <laughs> you go to New York City, they're not nice. Uh, so it, it was a lot of people and it was populated, but I was kind of like impressed with how knowledgeable, how nice, how helpful the people were. Um, they weren't angry and mean and hateful. And yet when we'd go to the other side of town where some of the other people were, 
they didn't want to talk to you. They want to have anything to do with you. So it was interesting. Um, Deuteronomy 26, Deuteronomy 26, 18 and 19. God says this about the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 26, 18 and 19. And it says, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people. Avouched means affirmed. So the Lord hath affirmed thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations which he hath made, in praise and in name and in honor, and that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. Now, has that happened yet? No. The day that, that, that Israel is the one that everyone praises and is the highest nation on the earth would be in the millennial kingdom. But going over there and seeing it, wow, they, they are a peculiar people. It is a peculiar thing to see that. And the correlations with America was pretty amazing for me too. They had to fight for their independence to become a country. That's what America did. And so there's a lot of correlations there. But there's all different kinds of Jewish people, and uh, many of them were very friendly, nice people, and very family-oriented. But then there were the Pharisees, <laughs> you know, little curly hair people. And I watched a couple of times. They would always go to the Wailing Wall. They'd always wear their little yarmulke thing like this, you know. I got this at the Wailing Wall. I just grabbed it and ran away. I think they were free. I hope they were. But um, And... They're very, very religious, and this is called a tallit. And the tallit you put around you like this. Have you ever seen Fiddler on the Roof, that show, that movie? If you have, you would have seen the, the main guy. So they wear this under their clothes, and I don't know if you can see it from there, but see these little tassels? They'll put a shirt on so you don't see this, but you'll see those little tassels. And everywhere I went, I saw so many people and plain dressed, but their little tassels showing down here. And it made me think of Fiddler on the Roof, you know, and they'd wear their little yarmulke and all that stuff. So it was interesting to see them, but we were on the Sabbath. We were driving around. Oh, no, you're not supposed to do that. And some of these kids that were the real conservative ones, they were yelling at us, you sinners, you're driving on the Sabbath. And so I was like, oh, modern day Pharisees, all right, you know. Um, and then there was another time, because everyone has to serve in the military. This woman was serving in the military, and this little, probably 16-year-old kid was yelling at this woman, telling her, you're dressed indecently, and you're, oh, you're awful, you shouldn't be in the military, and stuff like that. And she was pushing him, they were, I thought they were going to get in a fight. So there are some over there that are, funny mentalist, if you will, <laughs> that, that are just very strict and will yell at you because they have that attitude. Look at me, I'm following the law and you're not. What does that sound like to you, Pharisee? So you got to uh, understand that and, and realize that there's some people over there like that. I posted a video today about the two types of Jews that I saw. I don't know if you've seen that yet, but um, there are different Jews. There's the Hasidic Jews. There's the Ashkenaz. Uh-oh. I make say, when I said this to the tour guide, he got mad. I always call it the Ashkenazi Jews. He's like, no, we know Nazis. Ashkenazi, he said. Okay, well, however you want to pronounce it. So there's the Hasidic Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, the Sephardic Jews, and other types of Jews. And then there's Ethiopian Jews. Down in Ethiopia, they, they said they're Jews, and they wanted to migrate, and they did. And so it was really weird. You're here with all these Jewish people. They all look alike with dark hair and stuff. And all of a sudden... Where'd you come from? Well, I'm a Jew. And you're like, explain that, you know? Oh, okay. Well, all right. You're an Ethiopian Jew then. Okay. That makes sense. But uh, they're very friendly. I enjoyed meeting people and um, it was pretty interesting. It was just interesting, but it was, it was, it made me think of the time of Jesus. You would have had those Pharisees. You, you would have had the same groups almost, it seems like. And we know that one of the disciples of Jesus was a black guy. You know, um, so from Nigeria, it said in the Bible. So it was interesting meeting the people and I enjoyed meeting them. And it was just a really nice time meeting the people. I learned a little bit about the politics. You know what? It's about the same as America. There's conservatives and then there's crazies. I mean, I mean, uh, what are they called? Uh, um, uh, what is the opposite of conservative liberals? And so you've got that going on. And uh, so when we're leaving the day before we left, we couldn't go down certain roads in Jerusalem because they were blocked off because of um, riots, not riots, but protests, protests. And then I get home and, and we turn on the news and it says there's protests against Netanyahu. I'm like, oh, I just saw that. You know, I was just I couldn't go down that road because of that. So that was kind of neat. But it's basically the same politics as here. And 
it's, you know, I don't even need to go there because it's not important, but we did get to visit the Knesset building and that was pretty interesting to see the Knesset building where they actually meet. And uh, we drove by and he pointed, pointed out, the tour guide pointed out, hey, over there's where Netanyahu lives down that street. And of course, police everywhere to protect them and all that stuff. But it was fun. It was neat. Now, the other thing that was pretty cool is the purity of the language. And the uh, tour guide is insistent that the first language was Hebrew. And that could be. It could be that Adam spoke Hebrew. And he was telling me the names in Hebrew of the animals and how it's exactly like whatever the animal is and things like that. And, um, you know, if that's true, that's the oldest language in the world. And it's still being spoken today. Isn't that amazing? How incredible is that? So for over 400 years, that language has been preserved. And the Jews for 2,000 years out of their land, living in different countries, and they preserved that language. Do you think that was maybe just a coincidence? Or do you think maybe just maybe that was God? So just to give you a couple of things, Bokor Tov means good morning in Hebrew. So I tried to pick up some Hebrew. I learned a couple of things. Toda. I said Toda a lot, which means thank you. Uh, Bruhim Abaim. You're welcome. Bete Avol. Bon Appetit. Enjoy your meal. Um, I don't even know if I wrote this down right. Mosh Lomech. How are you? Doesn't that sound horrible? You're spitting on somebody. Mosh Lomech. Oh. I'm fine, thank you. Oh, I mean, so there's some things like that. This one I learned a lot. Shlicha. Shlicha means excuse me. Somebody's in my way. Shlicha. Okay. So that was fun. Um, and then mala mata. Mala means up. Mata means down. So I was standing in an elevator and the lady goes, mala mata, mala mata. I go, uh, mata. And so, you know, so that was kind of cool to learn different words. And there's lots of other words too, but I didn't stay long enough to pick it up. But it would have been fun. Now, the way you say hello is shalom. And I'll talk more about that here in a minute. But they say hello and they say goodbye with shalom. But the amazing thing about Hebrew is that every, everything comes from a root word that's three letters. And why is that so incredible? Because the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's just a language that everything comes from three. And there must be something to that is all I'm saying. It just, it just sounds like that might be God made that language. So I got a, a New Testament in Hebrew, and you know, they read backwards, so open it this way. But you pass it around, and you can look and see what Hebrew looks like. And it looks like chicken scratch. It looks like a chicken just went like this in the dirt. But it's an interesting language, and you can look at that. You can pass that around see what you think. Uh, the other thing I learned about was persecution. The persecution. And there has been persecution against the Jews for many, many years. And Jesus even talked about it in Matthew and things like that. Well, the, the uh, Romans, you know, uh, did what they did in 70 A.D. and the Jews had to flee. And they've been persecuted for the last 2,000 years. But the biggest thing and the reason that a lot of people aren't going over there now is because of what happened on 10-7. And we think of 9-11, don't we? We think of 9-11 here in America and everybody, oh, 9-11, war on terror. Well, 10-7 is their 9-11. And it's when their terror war, if you will, started. And you remember, hopefully, what happened out of Gaza. They bulldozed down a lot of fences and they brought in all these people that just started murdering in cold blood. Some of them came across on uh, little paragliders and things like that. Over 1,300 Jewish people were murdered. 240 abducted from their homes. Many were kidnapped and still held by Hamas. And everywhere you go in Israel, you see a little yellow sign. It says, bring them home now. They want their... And, and I don't know why they do this, but Israel said, look, we'll give you 700 of your prisoners to each one of ours. I don't know why they would do that, but um, they even want their bodies, even if they're dead. They would, they would exchange because they want the bones, just like in the Bible, don't leave my bones in Egypt. So it's just a horrible thing. And sitting down with the tour guide and him translating and talking to people and the things they saw... Should I even go into the, just the brutal, nasty, horrible killings? Um, many of the, the terrorists that, that killed, um, they bragged about it. They would murder and they would rape women. And then they called their mom and say, aren't you proud of me, mom? I, I killed five of them. And uh, one guy, he raped this woman and he told his mom, I, I raped her, mom. Aren't you proud of me? And then I put the gun in her and pulled the trigger. And just hearing stories like this just tear you up. 
and then coming to America and them saying, oh, those evil Jews, well, they stole the land and all that. And you're like, no, they're, they're the victim. Why are you on the side of the, the guys that brag to their moms about doing horrible? It just doesn't make sense. But go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22. So you see what's happening. And I can see why the world is against them because the world wants to believe the lie rather than the truth. And uh, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, Jesus said these words, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And here we go um, in these different areas that our, our tour guide took us. And Hezbollah was shooting rockets across. And um, there were places that we went that... Minutes later, rockets hit. Now, we didn't hear them or see them, but we drove from here down here, and it was like 20 minutes maybe later. These are rocket strikes, and here we were right here going this way. So that, those rockets come across from Hezbollah, and uh, they just they don't care who they kill. They just hate Israel. And a lot of times the rockets fall on, on Muslims, and they don't care. And so uh, the brutal killings, the things like that, and so God kept us safe, but we went all the way up here. We went around. We saw. So up here is Hezbollah, the terrorist group that's attacking Israel. Down here is Hamas in Gaza. And then there's the Houthis or whatever they're called down here. And so there are people that hate Israel and want to kill. And what was interesting is that our tour guide, he was ex-military, and he would take us some places that other tour guides probably wouldn't take you. And he took us up here close to the Lebanon border, and they had evacuated five kilometers from the border so people wouldn't get hit. So there were whole cities that he would drive us through that were ghost towns where people weren't because they had been evacuated, just like the Bible says, from one city to another being persecuted. So that was pretty amazing. One of the soldiers said, man, I, I think the war is going to start in May and June. That's what he told us. And another soldier, he says, unfortunately, I can't let you come any farther because you are in a war zone, he said. And I was like, oh, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> you know, because it didn't bother me. Rockets are, that happens all the time. But from 10-7, there's not been one day that there hasn't been some sort of a terrorist attack against Israel. And that's just so sad to see and to think about and, and to see why these people want to hurt these people. And so uh, my tour guide, he, he felt like it was his ministry to go to the soldiers and witness to them. He would give them handkerchiefs with, with Hebrew on it and things like that that were green color, that were military colors. And um, one of the ladies, uh, he told her, be safe because the rockets are coming. And she said to us, she said, Shalom. Shalom means hello. Shalom says goodbye. And so we said hello to her, Shalom. But as we're leaving, she said, Shalom. But the way she said it, it means peace, too. It was like she was saying, hey, I hope no rockets fall on your head. She wasn't just saying goodbye. She was saying, hey, I hope you're in peace and not in pieces. You know what I mean? So it was pretty incredible how, you know, words have meanings. And a lot of those soldiers were just stressed out because you never know where that rocket's going to hit. And so whenever we would stop and talk to the soldiers, he told us, you just tell them, you know, how you feel. And so we tell them, look, we stand with Israel. We love you. We support you. We just want you to know that somebody cares about you and is praying for you. And you could see them. They were so depressed that kind of perked them up a little bit. So that was good. And so we saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of that. We saw the persecution against the Jews. We also saw the peril that they're going through. And if you think 10-7 was, was it, no, it's going to get worse. It's probably going to get way worse. And there hasn't been, like I said, a day since 10-7 without some sort of incident. We were supposed to go to Jericho, but the day before there was a knife attack by a terrorist. So we didn't get to go see the city of Jericho like I wanted to. So Hamas is at the southern border. Hezbollah is at the northern border. They fire rockets. Um, the knife attack in Jericho. Oh, the tour guide was worried about snipers. So I get out of the car to do a video and there's Mount Hermon and you hear beep, 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 beep. That's him honking. And he's like, get in the car quick. He goes, I didn't realize that's Lebanon right there. And there are snipers in Lebanon that, that want to try to pick people off. So who knows if there was a sniper up there, but it still made you think, wow, well, why'd you drop me off here, you moron? You know, no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but why'd you do that? No, but um, seriously, he was worried about us. And the border of Israel makes no sense, right? Let's say this is Israel right here. The border is right here. 
So anybody can come over here and shoot down on you. That just bothered me. How could you have a border like that? Well, they didn't get to set the borders, did they? So they're giving the advantage to the bad guys to shoot against them. Isn't that sad? And um, it was very, very interesting. Israel has 10 million Jews, and they're surrounded by about 1 billion Muslims. And some Muslims love the Jews. Many of them go into Israel and work and make money, and they live in peace. But then you have your radical extremist terrorists who do not like, like them at all. And um, we went to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, and um, we saw the old border of Syria. And the old border of Syria was right there on the bank of the, of the Sea of Galilee. And Syrians would sit up there with their guns and try to pick off the Jewish um, fishermen. So when they won one of the wars, they said, no, the border's way back here now. <laughs> so now you can drive around the whole Sea of Galilee and not get shot at. Not get shot at. So that was interesting. Now, I also saw the preaching over there. And uh, they don't like it very much that you preach about Jesus. But they're allowing it more and more because so many Christians have said we're friends of the Jews. They've just finally said, OK, we give up. Thank you for being our friend because you're like the only one we have. So they're starting to at least, you know, accept the fact that, OK, they're going to preach Jesus no matter what we do. But I also saw there's what's called Messianic Jews. And there's about 40,000 Messianic Jews in Israel. And they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, out of 10 million that don't, that's not a lot. But they're growing in numbers every day. And many of them preach the who message, but they forget the what message. And so that's what I was trying to do is, is trying to figure out what's going on. And it's amazing that all these Jews are telling the other Jews, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. And that's great. They need to believe that. But will they go at the rapture if they just believe Jesus is the Messiah? So they're preparing them for the tribulation, but not for the rapture. So I took the track with me that I wrote called, Have You Received the Atonement? And uh, I tried to witness to him and say, hey, look, it's not just that who he is. You need to trust what he did for you. Because what he did is he shed his blood and he made the atonement. And if you receive that atonement, you're saved. Many Jews are still thinking we got to do the red heifer thing or we got to do the atonement in the rebuilt temple. So it's not enough to just tell them that Jesus is the Messiah, but you're planting the seed. That's a good thing. But you definitely need to point them to the atonement of Christ. So they will go at the rapture. But it was amazing to me to see that these people are telling them like the tribulation message before. And the tour guide, he used a weird term that I never heard before. He said, that guy over there is a pre-believer. I said, what's a pre-believer? He goes, well, he's, he's this much farther along but he's not quite here yet. But he says, I, I believe the, the way he's going, he's going to be here soon. So he called him a pre-believer. I thought that was, well, okay, that's a weird term. But in his mind, he kept planting the seed so much that the guy keeps believing a little bit more and a little bit. But you can't stop with just Jesus is the Messiah. You need to point him to the atonement of Christ because a lot of Jews, what do they want? They want that sacrifice of the atonement of the animal thinking that's what saves them. They want the Old Testament atonement they're not accepting the New Testament atonement. So it's almost like seeing two Gospels being preached. You know, one of them is, hey, just believe he's the Messiah. Not enough, but that'll sure help him in the tribulation. But then the true Gospel is trust the atonement of Christ. So you go at the rapture. So that was pretty fascinating to me to see. And um, I didn't get to give out a lot of tracts because you can't. There are some places that you're not allowed. So the tour guide says, no, you can't do that here. You can't do that here. But I had my little card here on YouTube. And he says, well, yeah, you can give them one of those so they can look me up on YouTube. And so I guess, well, OK, let me give you a story. In Joppa, I go into this antique store and I said, hey, where's the bayonets? Because they had all this old military stuff. He goes right over here. So, I'm like, oh, cool. I made a video for Knives Are Cool and Axes 2 channel. And this little kid, about 14, comes up and he goes, Knives Are Cool and Axes 2. I watch you on YouTube. I go, what? And so all the way over in Israel, he watches my other channel. I said, have you seen this channel? Have you seen my other channel where I preach? He goes, no. And so I couldn't give him this track because there's a law in Israel that you can't proselyte children. So I couldn't give him this. So I'm looking at the tour guy. He goes, no, give him this one. He says, because all you're doing is saying, hey, you watch me on YouTube. Well, here, here I am on YouTube. And see how, see how you get away with it, so to speak? Because he watched me already. He wants to see my other channel. He asked for it. So I'm not trying to, but 
just pray for him, you know, that if he's not saved, that he'd get saved. So there are ways to do preaching, but um, the preaching that's being done is just the message of who. And so I really stress to my tour guide, don't forget the what message. Don't forget to point them to the blood of Jesus so they do go at the rapture. But maybe some need to stay behind so they can preach that message in the tribulation to the others. So I don't know. All I know is I just did my best to try to point them to the blood of Christ, not what they're looking for, the blood of an animal. You know what I'm saying? Because they want to rebuild that temple. So I saw the preaching. Uh, I also saw the prophecy. And uh, there's a lot more prophecy that's still to come. But let's turn to Romans 11 real quick. Romans 11. And uh, yeah, it's... It's amazing to go there and see what the apostles saw and see the sights. And it's still the same people. Now, maybe some of them are real Jews. Maybe they're not. But hey, if they become a citizen of Israel, what are they? They're an Israeli now. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have to get circumcised to do that. <laughs> I hope not. But anyway, Romans eleven twenty five 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. They don't want you to tell the gospel to children. But it says, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sake. So we don't look at Jews as our enemy. We look at them and go, wow, how come they don't want the gospel? Oh, well, well we still love them. And we tell them that and we pray for them and we, we want to see them as a nation come to Jesus because we know Jesus will reign there for a thousand years. But uh, it was very, very interesting to see how blind many of them were. Now, my tour guide, he was a Messianic Jew. And so he would go and he would tell them Jesus is the Messiah. And he said they didn't want to hear that. And, but they're looking for a Messiah. So if he'd say things like this, aren't you, aren't you excited the Messiah's coming? They'd say, yeah, yeah, we can't wait for him to come. But he didn't want them to get the wrong Messiah because we know they're going to choose the Antichrist instead of Jesus Christ. So he began to witness like this to them. And again, it was more of the who message than the what message. But this is how he did it. And I watched him do that. And I watched him go because it, they didn't know how to answer. He would go up to him and he'd go, aren't you ready for the return of the Messiah? And there usually it was, aren't you ready for the Messiah to come? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he would use that word return. Aren't you ready for the return of the Messiah? They go, what? <laughs> because if you say yes, then you're saying Jesus was the Messiah and he's coming back. And so that made him just kind of think. And I'm sure that kept him thinking, what did he mean by the Messiah returning? He hadn't come yet. What was he saying? And he's a Jew saying that to another Jew. Uh, I just thought that was neat because he, he figured that out, how to say it in a way that would make him think. So that was fun. I also saw, like I said, the peace. And it's great that there was peace, but there's not always peace. But there was, I mean, I just felt so peaceful wherever we went, even though all that stuff is happening, because the people were so peaceful. And again, shalom means hello and goodbye, but it also means peace. But... Even though there's relative peace in the midst of war, like whenever we were at the war of, of terror, you know, when we, well, 9 11 and all that, what they call that, the war on terror, we felt like peace here in America, didn't we? We didn't think anything's going to happen. It just happened in New York, okay? But even though there's relative peace there, there won't be for long. And I thought about that, how sad. World War I prepared the land for the Jews with the Balfour Declaration, World War II prepared the Jews for the land because they're being killed. Hey, we just want to go somewhere and be somewhere. And many of the Jews returned to their homeland after almost 2,000 years. All they wanted was a home and a place to have peace because nobody wanted them. In 1492, they were kicked out of Europe. And all of Europe said, we don't want Jews here anymore. We're done with Jews. Get away. So Jews have always wanted a home and, and a place to have some peace. And so I'm walking around Jerusalem and I'm just seeing all these Jews. They were very family oriented. They got their kids, their wife and husband. And they're just, they all just look so happy. And I almost started bawling. I'm just like, this, this is so beautiful. I mean, God did this, put these people back in their land. And it just, and they're all happy. But what's about to happen? 
there's going to be something bad. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, because we know our Bible. We know that there has to be some sort of horrible war that takes place for the next thing in the Bible to take place, which is the tribulation. And the Antichrist comes in. Antichrist comes in saying, hey, 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 I'm the man of peace. Let's, let's cut this out. And the whole world follows him for the peace. We can't have peace without a war. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3 says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So there's going to be some, some bad, sad, horrible things. And again, like that, told, that soldier told me, he expected a war in May or June. Well, it would all work out perfectly for this year to be the rapture, wouldn't it? <laughs> I hope so, but if not, well... I really feel like there's going to be another 10-7 against them. And I hate to see that. I, they just want peace. So war might come. Even World War III might come. We're here and talk about that. It might be a World War III. This would lead, though, to a peace and the Antichrist coming in. And the biblical prophecy will come to pass of Daniel's 70th week and them rebuilding the temple and things like that. So that means the rapture must be soon. And what's happening tomorrow? The eclipse. Are you ready for that? Have you heard about that? That's pretty wild, man. And that eclipse happened. And it's going all over these cities named Nineveh, right? And, and all these. And this just can't be coincidence. Well, so I get back from Israel. We turn on the TV. There's an earthquake in New York City. Well, it was centered in New Jersey over a town named what? Lebanon. <laughs> you, think, you think all this is just coincidence? Nothing to see here. Or do you think God was like, Robert Breaker was close to Lebanon. They almost hit him with missiles, so I'm going to send a message. Hey, Lebanon, cut it out. No, no, it wasn't for me. But maybe, maybe God is telling Lebanon, hey, cut it out. These are my people. You don't, you don't go do that. I don't know. I just find it fascinating that it <laughs> hit on Lebanon. That's, that's really weird. Really weird. So let's go to Psalms 122 and verse 6. And um, we as Christians... We know our Bible. We know something's going to happen. We know God's going to ultimately rule in Israel for a thousand years. Okay? So Psalms 122 and verse 6. This is what we should do. Psalms 122 and verse 6. It says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. So I'm going to love Israel. I'm going to love those people. Maybe they're real Jews. Maybe they're not. I don't care. Whoever they are, they're people that need to be saved. Amen? And so I'm going to try to get them the gospel, which is what I'm trying to do. But I'm also going to pray. But if I'm praying for peace, I'm ultimately praying, Jesus, come back. Because you're the only one that can bring peace. But also, they shall prosper that love thee. So people don't understand how that we as Christians could love Israel. It's because we see they're God's chosen people. And that he said they'd go back and they'd have it and he'd rule over them for a thousand years. So uh, it was, for me, really amazing to see them, to visit with them, to understand that. And uh, the way that it's headed, there's more and more of the Messianic people believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, while I was over there, uh, there's two ladies that sent me an email. I said, man, come meet me. I want to meet you. And they were Messianic Jews for many, many years and they weren't saved. And they said they watched me online and they got the message. And in the messianic thing, they were mixing the law and grace. And they said they were living in fear. Oh, I got to do this to be saved. So do you see how you can't, you can't mix the law and grace? And yet the messianic, it does that. So true salvation is when you trust what Jesus did for you. And they told me, he said, man, when we got the message of trust the blood, we got saved. We're so happy. And they said, I can't wait for the rapture to come. Because now what? Now everybody's against them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not just the lost world's against them. Now those that claim to be Messianic Jews are against them because they're telling them, no, no, it's not the law and grace, it's grace. So they're kind of, you know, this group over here that are believers that uh, just, I, I, it's they're trusting in the blood. They'll go with the rapture. But the other ones, they haven't gone that far. They just believe who he is. They're not trusting in what he did. So that was very interesting. Well, the final thing here, and then I can't wait for questions because I'm sure you'll have some questions. But the final th thing here is the propaganda. The propaganda. You come to America and they tell you how evil the Jews are. And the Jews, and there's a reason for that. There's a teaching in many colleges today called anti-colonialism. And they go and they tell you, that the Jews came in and stole the land from the Palestinians. 
and they're evil because that land doesn't belong to them. Well, you read your Bible and God says that is their land forever. So you're against God. That will never work out well for you. They're the same people that say Americans are evil because they came over here and they took over this country from the Indians. Well, you start looking in, in history, you go, no, they came over here and they bought the land from the Indians. They bought New York with a handful of beads. No, granted, that was a dumb deal, <laughs> but that's what they did. They bought the land with a handful. And a lot of the other people that came over to America, the, they asked the Indians, can we buy this land? They said, nobody owns land. We're just nomads. We go, you, whatever. So they came over and took the land. The Indians even said, we don't view this as our land in many cases. So to try to say that a person has no right to be in a place is really dumb. You can't go back and change history. I counted seven generations of breakers in America. I'm a Native American. <laughs> Who are you to tell me I'm some sort of colonialist that shouldn't be here? I was born here. Okay. Well, in Israel, it's the same thing. That land, God said, belonged to them. Now, granted, they might not have been there for 2,000 years, but do you know God always had a remnant? For the last 2,000 years, there have been some Jews that were in that land. Did you know that? And so in the Balfour Declaration, England, who probably was a colonialist because they went over and took it over, uh, England said that land belongs to the Jews. And then in 1948, the United Nations said, this is your land. So... The thing that I'm seeing all over the news, I get emails, I get hate letters, I get all these things. Israel, oh, they're evil. They're trying to take over and steal the land. Free Palestine, free Palestine. And I'm like, so you don't go by what the UN said? You don't go by what the Balfour Declaration? You don't go by what God said? Who cares what the UN and the Balfour says? God says that's their land. And you're arguing with God. That will never work out good for you. But there are so many people that are against Israel because they say Israel's evil and they're, they're um, doing bad to the Palestinians and things like this. And that whole Gaza thing, they moved all of their own citizens out of Gaza and gave that land to the Palestinians. And then they gave them millions and millions of dollars to make it into something good. And Hezbollah comes, steals all the money, and then shoots rockets back at them. You know what Hezbollah did? They came into Gaza and everything was beautiful. It was like the blooming desert, like the Bible says. There were so much um, plants and everything there. There were so many people milking cows. and That place was awesome. And they gave it to those people. And the first thing they did is they went in and started digging up all the pipes for sewage and for water to turn it into rockets to shoot it back at Israel. And so they want you to think Israel's so evil because they're attacked. They gave that land to those people, tried to help them, gave them money. And then Hezbollah turned it against them to try to send it back. So it's, it's just so sad to hear the propaganda that Israel's the bad guy. So it's just sad to see the world blames the Jews for everything, yet they're defensive. They're only offensive if they're attacked. And you look at what they did to the Jews on 10-7. All they're trying to do is take Gaza back so that it's not used against them. It's called the Israeli Defense Force. And they only attack in offensive when they've been attacked themselves. So it's just sad to me, but it makes sense, doesn't it, that the world would be against, well, the world's against Christians because we're God's people. The world's against the Jews who are God's chosen people. Now we're saved, but they're not yet. As I read it to you, but one day they will be. So we should know and understand what's happening. And it's very, very sad to see the world on the side of the terrorists in many cases. And uh, I just don't know what else to do but just tell people what I saw. And what I saw was the Jews come into that land and in 77 years they just completely turned it into something great and wonderful and it works and everything's good. And then everyone else that's around them that hates them is trying to destroy them. So how are they the good guy and Israel the bad guy? You know what I mean? You do something productive and then everybody says you're the bad guy. But it fulfills prophecy, doesn't it? Because that's why the Antichrist comes in and takes over. And we are seeing the world hate the Jew and saying it's all the Jews' fault. Now, I could go way deeper into that. I'm not going to. And you know, 9-11. What do you think about 9-11? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think about 10-7? You think maybe some of the thing... Okay, I better not... 
I'll, I'll edit this out. So I see both sides, okay? I see both sides. But what is the side that we should be on? Israel. We should be on God's side. We should be on God's side. Because what if Israel goes against God? Well, what if America well, goes against God? Jesus. Yeah, and they've rejected Jesus. Yeah. So we don't hate them. We try to get them the truth. But I'm not going to join the IDF either. <laughs> you know, I, I just can't. The battle is a spiritual battle for their souls. And even for the souls of the Muslims. We want them to be saved as well. But people in power are corrupt. And they do corrupt things. And uh, instead of us placing the blame on this guy or that guy, and it's all your fault, let's let God sort that out. And let's look at the nation as a whole. And let's pray for their souls. Let's pray for them to be saved. Amen. So that's what I learned from Israel. Uh, I could go into a lot more. But what questions do you have? What questions? Anybody have a question? Yes, sir. Did you see the Masada? We drove by Masada and saw it from a distance. And the tour guide says, I don't like going there because it's just, to me, it's horrible to think that all these people killed their family and killed themselves. But it's way up there, like you said, and it's farther from Jerusalem than I thought. It's actually pretty close to Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, so, but we did see Masada from a distance. And uh, I wish we could have explored it more, but he, he seemed to say, there, you don't want to see that. I'm like, yeah, I do. No, there, it's just bad things happen there. And in, in the Jewish mind is, let's don't think about the bad things that happen. So, yes, sir. You went to, you've seen the Valley of Armageddon. Twice. It was a big valley. And it's, the thing about Armageddon, it wasn't big like this, like round. It was a big, long valley. So imagine the troops like in a long line. And so Jesus comes back and just slaughters them all and they're all in a line. So that's what was neat to me. It was more like, a, like this rather than, I always thought it'd be round like this. But in the middle, there's a little mountain called Megiddo. And it's a little mound almost. It doesn't even look like a mountain. And, and in the middle of it, it's almost cut out because they have excavated down. They found something like 28 different civilizations or something. All these different people lived on that little mountain. And that mountain's in the very middle of the valley. And of course, we couldn't go there either because it was in a part of the Palestinian Authority. And, and they said, if you go in there without somebody protects you, you might not come out. But we did get to see it. And so the Battle of Armageddon, Har means mountain, and Megiddo is the valley. So that's where you get Armageddon from, the little mountain of Megiddo. And it's right in the middle. So that was pretty cool to see that and be able to, with your eyes, because like I said, I pictured a big round valley. No, it's more elongated. So I did get to see, it's called the Valley of Jezreel as well. Yes, amen. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I have two questions. Okay. So you went to the tomb. Did you, are you allowed to go in it or just look in the... Okay, so... You come, you have to pay to come in, and you come in, and you can go that way to what they call Skull Hill, which is, which is Golgotha or Calvary, or you come back to the left this way. As you come to the left, you look down, there's an old wine press, which is kind of cool, and then you come, and you, they've redone a lot of that. You're, you're up here, and you can look down, and then you come down the steps, and you can go inside, and then they have um, like metal thing there so you can't go in all the way but you can look through it so you can go in it and the round stone is missing but they have another one which is like half the size that you can see uh, behind you but they've man they've made it all for tourism they built this building over here and then a balcony up here to look and usually we, we wouldn't have been able to do much filming there because there's so many people but thankfully when we were there there weren't as many people but it says, do not stop and take pictures because you're holding up the line. But thankfully, there was hardly anyone there. But you can go in and you can look. And when you go in, you turn. It almost looks like there were three places. But the more I thought about it, the middle is where he'd be. And those, those are places where you could be on either side kneeling down or something. But there was where Jesus would have laid. And then somebody, they say maybe the Templar people or whoever was there, they wrote the initials for Jesus Christ, and then they put Alpha and Omega on the wall, and they drew a cross. So they recognized that as the place of where Jesus was buried. And then Golgotha was right there where he would have been crucified. Now, the Catholics, here's the thing. Everywhere you went to a historic site, the Catholics built something on top of it. So it was always underneath the Catholic. You'd have to go in the Catholic church in order to go down to look at everything. So it's like... 
And now if you want to go, you know, look some more and dig some more up, you got to ask permission from them. Can we go dig in your basement? So it's just, it was really weird that, that they had done that. But where's I going with that? But they have in Jerusalem a separate spot where they say Jesus died and was buried. And we went to see that. And my tour guide says, this place to me is demonic because it's not the biblical Golgotha and it's not the tomb. It's the biblical tomb because the tomb says stone. There was a place for a stone. Everything the Bible says was right there with the tomb and Skull Hill or Golgotha. But their traditional Catholic site, they had built this huge tomb on top of. And as you go in, they have a rock and they say that that was the rock that Jesus was laid on. That rock's only five, six hundred years old. So how could that be the rock that Jesus? It's all tradition. But people believe that tradition. I watch people come in and get down and they kiss that rock. And then they go and they look at this tomb and they say, that's the tomb where Jesus was buried. And it was just some little cave way down. And there wasn't even a place for a stone to go or anything. And he was right. It felt demonic. When we walked in, it was so dark. And, and the stones were like, unlike any stones I saw, it was just black. They were nasty looking. And there's just smoke and fog everywhere. And I just felt like, dude, let's get out of here. And he told me that the columns out front of that Catholic church came from a pagan um, temple and things like this. So if you know your Bible, you can never believe that that was where Jesus died and was, was buried. But the Catholics believe that. And he told me when they give a tour, they ask you, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant or evangelical? And if you're a Catholic, that's the only place they take you. So you think that's where Jesus died and was rose. You don't get to see the other one. But a lot of times they would take the evangelicals and show them both. And the evangelicals are a process. No, it had to be this one because this lines up in the Bible. Look, a stone can roll. Right. So do you see the lie? Catholicism teaches a lot of tradition that's a lie. And people, that's all they've been taught. So that's what they believe. And they literally go in and they'll bow down and kiss it. That was, to me, that was just, it was really sad to see um, so much deception. And there was a lot of Catholic churches that we went inside because we had to see. And we went in that one that Fabriel went in, and I was able to, to get a picture of the serpent because in his video you couldn't see it very well. But he's right. We went in that Catholic church. It felt like going into Dracula's lair. The way that was said, it was like, this is creepy, dude, <laughs> you know? And we went into one Catholic church. And you walk all the way to the back and just look down. You can see everything was like 20, 30 feet below. So over 2,000 years, things build up that high. So you, look, you have to look down to see what it was in the time of Jesus. And then as I'm walking out, I look over. There's just a little glass. And I walked over. And down below, you can see ruins. So imagine sitting in church and looking down at that down below. And a lot of it was like that. A lot of glass and all, a lot of stuff. And I always wondered when Jesus comes back if he's just going to go and pull off like 30 feet or something and go, here's what it was when I was here, or if he's going to build on top of it. But it's just so weird how everything's 30 feet above where it used to be. And so it's just, wow, it was interesting. So what's your other question? Oh, uh, the uh, red heifers, did, did your tour guide talk about that? About he didn't know much about them. He knew they were in the Bible, and he knew that they had brought them to Israel, but he didn't know that they wanted to uh, sacrifice them on the Mount of Olives. So he didn't seem to know much about that and he didn't know where to find that information either. So a lot of it we just hear online. But if they're going to sacrifice those on the Mount of Olives, I don't know where because the Mount of Olives was so full of houses. It was just incredible. And one of the tours, uh, the tour guide, one of the places he took us was to the Mount of Olives in the middle of nowhere with all these houses around. And I'm like, where is he taking us? It was a beautiful view across and see Jerusalem. But he said, now this guy's so-and-so, and he'll take you in the cave. I was like, cave? I like caves. Let's go. It was called the Cave of the Prophets. And that's where Zechariah, Malachi, and Haggai were buried. And this guy just happened to own that for like five generations or something. And the cave was under his house. And you pay him so many shekels, he'd take you down, and he'd show you where they were buried. And guess what? No bones. And so I told my tour guide to go, where, where are the bones? He goes, oh, well, you know, probably crusaders dug them up over the years and all these. And they're just not. I said, have you ever thought of this? Jesus, when he rose, it says many of the saints which slept arose. And I said, maybe they're not there because they rose. And my tour guide went, oh, I never thought of that. He got excited. He was like, yeah, maybe that's what happened. So, but it was neat to see where they were 
they were buried. It was really incredible. And we didn't get to walk around the city of Jerusalem, but we drove around it. So I got to see all the gates. And what was weird is how it's set on bedrock. And a lot of the bedrock, they just they dug caves in there. So I'm just walking next to them, just like, I'm going in there. And I just walked right in. There's a bunch of garbage in there. But what could that have been? I don't know. It was probably someone's grave or something. But maybe that was a grave someone that was a saint was buried and it blew open when Jesus rose. I don't know, but it was just weird. There were so many caves everywhere we went. And a lot of sandstone and limestone everywhere. But Jerusalem was like this. It was just, you go somewhere, you're walking uphill and you're, <laughs> or you're walking downhill, you don't want to fall. So it was really amazing. And so I think Jesus... Uh, he had some big legs because he's going up and down. Moses, too. They're going up and down mountains and things like that. But it was really neat to see it all. Um, I don't know. I guess Jerusalem was a little smaller than I thought. But it was just, I don't know, it was different. And it's a lot more people. You see videos online. It makes it look like there's not a lot of people there. When I went there, I was just like, man, there's people everywhere. Houses everywhere. They just, they just keep building. So I don't know. I, I didn't like that there were that many people. But it was interesting. It was interesting. They, they didn't to Hezekiah's tunnel. We didn't get to go to Hezekiah's tunnel. That's another thing I'd like to have done. But you got to have your shoes that, you know, for walking and getting wet. You have to have a lot of things. And I would love to go there one day and see that. But the, the tomb of the prophets, that, that was something that most tours don't go on. So that was kind of a neat little thing to see. Yeah. Um. The, the war between the Jews and the Muslims, isn't that part of prophecy from Abraham? Well, yeah, how many of them are Amalekites? How many of them are Moabites or whatever? How, but yeah, um, they're always going to be fighting. But yeah, I mean, it's in the Bible they're going to fight back and forth. But it's sad because the Jews just want to live in peace. So why do these people want to hurt Jews? You've got to read their writings. And it does say strike terror in their hearts. I mean, you can't deny what their writings say. So they become extremists and they want to, and they're taught from an early age, go kill a Jew. And then, like I said, when they did, they'd call their mama and say, hey, I raped this girl and killed these guys. Are you happy, mommy? And that's just, oh, hurts your heart to hear that someone has that much hate in their heart for someone. And I didn't see the Jews having that hatred toward them. I didn't see that. So... That was just sad. Does that go back to Abraham's sin, where he took a different wife? No, um, that would be Lot. Remember Lot and his daughters? No. I... That was where you got the was it Amalekites and the others and some of those Moabites. Moabites. Moabites, yeah, something like that. Where he, Abraham didn't have a son, and then. Mm -hmm. Right, and that, that was with Hagar as well. Oh yeah, okay, so yeah, it, it, that's the, the flesh, right? He says in Galatians. So yeah, it goes back to that too. I can't remember what those were called. Was that Ishmael? Ishmael. Yeah, so the Ishmaelites, yeah. And some of it goes back to that as well. See how one person can sin and then 3,500 years later we have to deal with it? <laughs> it's just like, don't sin and make it easy for everybody. But yeah, yes ma'am. you get to see Jacob's well? We did not get to see Jacob's well. Um, we, there was a lot of things we didn't get to see, but um, Jacob's well was one of them. Beersheba, we got to go through that. Bear means well, so the well of Shiva or something. I just, my head's spinning, we saw so many things, you know, but it was really cool what we did get to see. And like I said, it, you just almost need three or four visits to see everything. And it was so sad that so much of it was closed. We saw the first day, we saw the city of Acre or Akko, and that was a well-known crusader city, and that was really cool. And uh, we then saw Caesarea, and that's where both Peter and Paul were, is Caesarea, and it was right next to the coast. And that's where Cornelius lived, and he sent his guys to Joppa and said, hey, come over here. So we saw the house that um, they say was of Sam, Simon the Tannerite, where Peter would have been when he had his, his vision in Acts chapter 10. Now, is that the real house? Well, those people claim they've been there for 2,000 years that own that. I don't know. Maybe it's the real location. It's just that house is 20, 30 feet below. You remember how everything? But that's the house they say was it. And on top of that house is the lighthouse. And on top of that house is a fig tree. And Peter went up on top of the house when he saw the vision. Well, it's a fig. 
you know, the nation of Israel is like a fig. And then the lighthouse, the gospel light. And it was just, I thought that was neat. That was kind of cool. And so from Joppa to Caesarea was a two day walk. So that made the book of Acts like become alive, you know, and then, and then he went over there and you're just like, well, it would have taken him two days to walk there. Wow, it's filling in the gaps in the Bible. And that was pretty neat. So we saw Caesarea and then Peter, that's where Peter was, uh, I mean, Paul, that's where Paul was taken. Whenever Paul um, was taken and arrested, he stayed in Caesarea for a while. So just neat to be in a place where you know that both Peter and Paul were at one time. That was pretty amazing. Yes. The Bible says, I will bless them that bless thee. Yeah, so uh, I would say, God bless you, God bless you to everybody. And then I'd sneeze on purpose, so they'd say, God bless you. And I'd be like, yes, yes, I'm blessed by a Jew. But uh, one guy, he says, Brother Breaker, you, God bless you. And I said, finally, you know, finally, I'm blessed by a Jew. God, did you hear him? Did you hear him? You know, but that was pretty cool. Uh, lots of jokes. They were funny. And uh, they told me some jokes, but I can't remember them, but. It was, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. What else, anybody else? I got, I got one. Yes. It's that orientation type question, like photos and videos don't give a good perspective on the, the garden tomb. If you're looking at it orientation wise, uh, how far away, it's three parts, how far away and uh, is it visible is the, uh, it's Calvary from, if you're looking at it. Okay, so the garden tomb was kind of on the Mount of Olives. It was across the, the Kidron Valley. And then you had to walk across to come over here. And it had walls around it. So I wouldn't even known it was there until we got out and went through the wall. And it was probably no bigger than your property here. That's the size of it. And there were these old, old, old olive trees. But it's right next to this huge church. And it's just, it's not in the middle of nowhere now. Like it would have been in Jesus' time. And there were just people everywhere and they were singing and it, I wanted to go there and find some quiet and solace, and it was just noise everywhere, cars driving. So it was a little sad that it's not like it was in his day. And you wouldn't have known except for the sign, Mount, uh, or the, the um, what's it called, the Garden of Gethsemane. And then you go through this little archway. And they've got sidewalks in between, and I just briefly just walked around as far as I could, but I only got to do like an L shape because over there is the church, and then these people were over here. So I didn't get to see it all. And they had it blocked off to where I couldn't walk in the middle of it and walk around. So it was neat to see it, but Jesus, he, he would go down from Israel and go up here on the Mount of Olives all the time. Remember we saw that? And so he's going back and forth. And I didn't even see a little brook there. It's called the Brook Kidron. So I don't know if the water dried up or what, but it wasn't a long walk. It was pretty close. It was pretty close. But uh, yeah, it's just, it was a little disappointing that so many people lived close by that it, it just, it felt like, that it's just like, oh, I wasn't like this in the Bible, you know, but there's just going to be more and more people. Who knows? The next time you go, it might be like everybody parks up there and it's a parking garage and you can only walk in. I don't know. But it was just, it felt like, man, come back, Lord, because it's overpopulated. It can't go anymore, can it? But it was, it was interesting to see that. Uh, we didn't get to go and see where Jesus was born, Bethlehem, because that was in the side of, the, of where the Muslim authority had. And we had to have a second tour guide who would protect us if we did. So we didn't get to go there. But we did get to go to Cana of Galilee, where Jesus did his first miracle. And then we got to go to Nazareth, where he lived. So we got to see Nazareth. And Cana of Galilee, he took us to a wine shop, because Jesus turned water into wine. And, you know, I'm just like... But the guy goes, you want wine? I go, no, man, I don't want any alcohol. He goes, I got non-alcoholic. I said, pour me a glass. So I got to try some non-alcoholic pomegranate wine. It was pretty good. But I was like, what do you do with this? Oh, we do communion with this. I was like, okay. But he was selling a lot of alcoholic stuff <laughs> to a lot of people. And that was, that was interesting. But um, we saw a lot of amazing things. When we were at the Sea of Galilee, we went to a little town of Magdala, I think it was called Migdal, Migdal or Magdala. That's where Mary Magdalene came from. Remember the one that Jesus cast seven devils out of? And they have found, and of course it's over a Catholic church, or the Catholic church was right next to it. They have found the ruins of the synagogue of that place. No doubt Jesus would have gone in that synagogue and read scriptures. No doubt Mary Magdalene would have probably gone to that synagogue. And it was very well um, 
taken care of. And always they have mosaics, which is they use these little tiles about that big and they have designs on the floor. And so we got to walk through that and see that and think, wow, Jesus would have been here and Mary Magdalene too. Probably Peter and everybody else came into this little synagogue. So that was pretty neat. Yes. Tell us about the food. The food was fantastic. Um, you know, you've been to, where do we go? To the Greek place, Phineris Brothers. You know, it's kind of like that. But it was just, we went the last day, the um, tour guide took me to the Man in the Sea restaurant or something in Joppa. So we're sitting there in Joppa looking over here, mullet everywhere. There's where the ships go out. Right over there is where that house was that Peter was in. And um, we sit down at the table. The guy brings out like 16 different dishes that big. Each one's a different dip. And then he brings over the um, pita bread. And we just start dipping in every one. It was just so good. Baba ganoush and tahini sauce and garlic sauces. And there was one that looked just like tomato sauce, but man, was it hot. Oh, it was hot. And so, yeah, I like that kind of food. Um, I bet you made that joke about the soft Yeah, yeah. The first, the first day he took us out and the other two guys that were there, I went, is this for you? He goes, hey. So that was kind of funny. So I gave him the sop. But yeah, that was, man, I, the food was just amazing because you know in Europe and in, in places like that, they don't do GMO stuff. So the food was, was incredible. I wish we could eat like that here in America instead of all this garbage that they feed us. But it was really fun to um, try the different kinds of, of food. And there were so many other kinds that I never got to see. He kept mentioning stuff, and I'm like, I don't know what that is. I'd have to look it up on the phone. He kept talking about carib, carib. I think, it was, I think it's spelled like this, carib. And I still don't know what carib is, but it's some sort of elongated like thing, pod that grows. And it almost tastes like chocolate. And you can chew on it. I wanted to try that, but we didn't see it anywhere. But they would either drink coffee or tea. And so a lot of places we'd stay, they'd have coffee. Other places, tea. You know, like the Arabs would have that little silver thing and you put your tea in it. And that tea, whatever it was, was amazing. It was really good tea. But there's all these little herbs that would come out too. So you're drinking herbs. But the food was really, really good, and I really enjoyed it. And the best part was that that Mediterranean, uh, the Sea of, sea of Tiberias is the Sea of Galilee. So, yeah, it was the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. We stayed in Tiberias at the Ron Beach Hotel, one of the best hotels. And every morning they'd have the most amazing breakfast. And they had blue cheese that was green instead of blue. And it was like almost like uh, cream cheese, the consistency. And I'd get like that much on my plate and just, oh, that was the best cheese I've ever had in my life. I just, if I knew where that was from, I'd invest in the company. I mean, that was so good. But uh, anything you wanted, they had it there. It was really good. I, and their bread was fresh, real barley bread. And so I didn't feel bad eating bread. It was really good. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And the people were nice, really nice. Yes. Well, regarding politics, um, did you get any sort of impression what their feeling is for the upcoming American election, considering what Trump did in 17 and well, they, so far? I'll just say this. They're not pleased with the person who's in charge now because they don't feel like he has their back. And that's all I'll say now. Does the other guy have their back? I don't know because I didn't really talk about it. But I got that kind of insinuation that yeah. they knew he was on their side, if you will. So I don't know. But... Uh, yeah, it was, I, I try not to talk too much about that, but it was fun talking to them, and we talked for probably 20 minutes with these one guards, and they'd always come out, and I'd look at their gun, and I'd be like, oh, that's a Tavor, man. Yeah, that's a Tavor. Oh, that's an M16. Whoa, is that a, is that a or optic reflex two you got on there? Yeah, man, how'd you, you just, I enjoyed talking that with them, but um, it was fun, and it was cool. He took us to an Army-Navy store, and of all places, the, you know, the second or third day we went to an Army-Navy store and he gave us a couple patches. So that was kind of fun. The Army-Navy store, I don't have them here. But yeah, we saw a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool stuff. And so when are we all going back? Let's go together next time. But it was pretty incredible. And the tour guide was Yaron. He was a wonderful person and he needs more business because like I said, a lot of people are afraid to go. So. If you want to go to Israel, I have one lady emailed. I'm going to give her his information because she's going. She's got her ticket. She just doesn't have a guide, so I'm hoping he can help her. But um, I blessed him the best I could, 
and he gave me the biggest hug, and now we're friends forever, amen? But he could tell that I cared about him, and I could tell he cared about me. And just that, that love, just because we serve the same Jesus, amen? But, um, yeah, that was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Anybody else? How far was Patmos from where you were? Oh, Patmos is all off the coast of, is it Turkey? or It's closer to Greece, so it was pretty far, that was pretty far. And uh, it would be in modern-day Turkey, I think, the island of Patmos. But, yeah, he was on the Mediterranean, but he was facing east. And so I was way down here in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is pretty cool. Um, Har means mountain. Tel means spring, I think, if I remember right. And Kirat means little town of. So there's all these little things that I learned. Anybody else? Come on, man. This is fun. (laughs) So, yeah. I wish I could remember something else, but that's about all I remember. All I know is I hated to leave, but it was uh, amazing to learn all that, to see all that, and but just to know what's coming next. I feel sorry for them because they're going to go through some stuff, and it's good that they want to have an atonement. It's just sad they're going to have the wrong one, and that's what angers God is the fact that they rebuild the temple and sacrifice because they're saying... What you did, we don't accept. Will you accept this? What's that remind you of? Cain and Abel. (laughs) It's like Cain going, God, will you accept what I did? And God goes, no, I'm only accepting the blood of a lamb. And in this case, it's the blood of Jesus, the lamb of God. And they don't see that yet. So it's kind of sad. But we did the best we could. Yes, ma'am. Tell them what tracks I tried to get you. Go ahead. What track? Remember the tracks I gave you first? Who killed Jesus? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She goes, give him this track. Who killed Jesus? I'm like, I don't think they'd accept that too much. Um, So we went with, have you received the atonement? And we went to, well, I'll tell you this. We went to, he knew what I liked, I guess, because I like going to the old part of town where the flea market is, the garage sales, the the, um, thrift stores, the, the antique shops. And he took us down there and I said, ask him if anybody has any old coins. I like old coins. And we went in this old shop and this guy goes, yeah, I got silver coins. What you want? And the Jews have, I guess, some of them, the business people, they want you to buy something or else leave them alone. You don't waste their time. Well, I wasn't wasting his time. I just like, show me this. He showed me four or five. He goes, you're going to buy it or what? I go, oh, well, if it catches my fancy, what else you got? <sighs> well, if you buy one of those, I'll show you some more. I go, come on, just show me some more. Then I'll tell you if I'll buy it or not. And so he showed me one. I said, okay, put that aside. I'll buy that one for sure. Show me some more. And so now he kind of opened up a little. And then I gave him this. And, and well, I bought a coin and it said for meritorious conduct. So it would have been a silver coin for a soldier of Israel. And I bought that and then I gave it to my tour guide. I said, for meritorious conduct for what you did for us showing us around. Oh, he, he, he thought that was so awesome. So I was glad to be able to do that. But then I gave this guy this, this track. It says, have you received the atonement? He goes, what's this, atonement? He goes, what? And I said, I said, all right, what am I gonna do to get him to take this? I go, the atonement, don't you know Leviticus 17, 11? The life of the flesh is in the blood. Did you, you guys talk about this in the synagogue. Oh yeah, they talk about it in the synagogue. I remember atonement. I go, yeah, that Old Testament one. <laughs> so that, cause it mentions that, but then it tells you the other one. But he didn't want it. He goes, yeah, they talk about that all the time here. And he gave it back. I said, well, look me up on YouTube. And he took this one. So he can find it. But he didn't want, isn't that sad? So he wouldn't take my track from me. But he sold me a coin from 1967 that commemorates the, um, the Six Days War. Or was it? Yeah. Yeah, the Six Days War. And uh, it was pretty cool. And he gave a pretty decent price on it. So that was pretty cool. Because I don't like overpaying. I guess I'm part Jewish too, you know. But um, I don't like they would charge you a lot if they saw you were American. So I'd have to tell my tour guide, tell them I don't want it unless they'll give me a good deal. Okay, he'll give you a deal. So that's the way I tried to do it. But I'm glad I got to bring you all a rock and a shekel and, and a magnet and stuff like that. Just pray for me, pray for them, pray for the tour guide, Aaron, Yaron. And he recently got married and he's older, but um, pray for his mom too. And pray for everybody there, that God protect them from from extremist terrorists. That'd be the best way to say it, you know, mm-hmm. extremist terrorists. Yeah. Anybody else? I'm sure you have more questions. If not, you can ask me after. But Ray's dying over there, I know, for a question. Did you have a question? 
Hey, you're good. Okay. Yes. I'm curious about the topography. So, like, uh, from Jerusalem going outwards, because it's kind of in the middle, you know. Like, as you go closer to the yeah. border, like in the north, like, was it more mountainous? Was it flat? Was it vegetated? So over here somewhere was Mount Hermon. So that's Mount Hermon. This is the Golan Heights. These are the big mountains, the big mountains. So when you come from the coast, it, it almost feels like there's 10, 15, 20 miles where it's just flat. Then you start getting into the mountains. And so Jerusalem, of course, is in the mountains. You go to the Sea of Tiberias, you're going downhill and then back up just a little bit. But the Dead Sea, it's down, 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 way down. Because the Dead Sea is like its lowest point on earth. And then this is the wilderness of Zin, or sin in the Bible. And the King James translators, they put Z-I-N once, but other times they put S-I-N. They just happen to do that. Oh, that's a mistake in the King James Bible. Not when you do the math. The word uh, sin, S-I-N, shows up 448 times. And the word uh, blood shows up 448 times. So there's, for every sin in the King James Bible, there's enough blood. So I don't think it was a mistake that they spelled it with an S. I think that was God. But we went around the wilderness of Zen, and that was horrible, man. It was desert everywhere, and it was just crazy to think that they were out there for 40 years, just walking around on all these mountains and all this, and it's nothing but dirt. And then we went to the ascent of Akrabim, which means the scorpion ascent, and the road was like this the whole way up. And we get up to the top, and we could see Mount Zin. And it said in Exodus, I think it is, This shall be your borders, O Israel, from here. Make a compass from here. So it's like, make a compass from here to here. And that's the beginning of your borders. So do they get that? Or did God say, this is supposed to be the borders? And then he says, from up here too. And so really, the present day is where some of the border is. So Israel should never have a two-state solution where they give up that land because the Bible itself says, starting from here, this will be your borders. And so for them to give it away, it's almost like saying, God, we don't care what you said. And for sure, the United Nations and even America that wants a two-state solution, they don't care what the Bible says. But God says, this is your borders. And it, it really is a lot more than that. But it's just interesting how modern day is pretty close to what the Bible says. And then they want us to give it away. And Israel should be way out here. And the reason it's not is because in World War II, the guy that I don't like too much, but Winston Churchill, he divided the land. And they came to him and they said, what do you do? He says, well, where do you want it divided? And there was so much fighting on either side, he just went, where's the river? Okay, there's your border. And he pretty much followed the Jordan River as the border. And so that's how, that's how it worked out for today. And you look at Israel on a map, it's just a little sliver is what it looks like. That's not a country, a little sliver. It should be way bigger according to the Bible, and someday it will be. Most of all, the Euphrates, isn't it? It should. It should go all the way to Euphrates. And then even down here, Mount Sinai, they owned it one time and they gave it back. I don't know why, because then Mount Sinai, you would have had this side of the um, Red Sea as well. But I learned so much. And so the typography is, it's uh, all mountainous wilderness here. From here down, just no green hardly until you get down here and it starts to get green. Sodom would be around right here. Masada was about over here someplace, or maybe it was more up here. But you get into the mountains, you go up to Jerusalem. You're going up to the mountains, and there are lots of mountains, very green from here to here. And then you got a lot of mountains over here. But the biggest mountains were the Golan Heights. And then there was somewhere around here was Mount Carmel. I can't remember where it was. But remember when um, Elisha went into the cave after he killed the prophets of, of Jezebel? Well, there are caves everywhere on that mountain. So who knows which one it was, but they were there. So everywhere we went, I'd look at what the Bible says, and it lines up. How can anyone say the Bible's not true? We go to up here, and we're driving along, and up here is a place called Bashan. You heard the bulls of Bashan? Well, all up here was a whole bunch of bulls. To this day, there are people that have bulls in Bashan. And it says the cedars of Lebanon. We're driving up here close to the border of Lebanon. All of a sudden, we start seeing cedar everywhere. And then it said the oaks of Bashan. We start coming south into Bashan. There's oaks everywhere. Just like the Bible says. You think that's a coincidence or do you think the Bible's true? 
Yeah. Where would the Garden of Eden have been in the original? Well, the Garden of Eden probably would have been way down here somewhere because you have the four different um, rivers and two or three of those are still around. So it was probably way down in that area. But yeah, so it was amazing to learn all that and to go from one into another. But looking back on it now, no wonder people were saying, we're praying for you, you idiot. Why are you going to a war zone? And I'm thinking, there's no war zone. There's nothing. And now looking back, I'm like, yeah, there's a war zone there. I mean, who knows when a missile out of nowhere could fall anywhere. And usually they hit from here up. But you're driving around in here. You could be hit by a missile or a knife attack or a sniper or something. So it's and it's only going to get worse, I think, because the world is helping the terrorists by saying Israel's bad when Israel's the victim. And no, they're not colonialists that took this land over. They returned to what was theirs. And even the Balfour Declaration, even the UN said, yeah. So it's just, you're against God if you're against saying that that belongs to Israel. That's the only way I can see it. You know what I mean? So when are we gonna make our Aliyah? <laughs> Let's all go to Israel, you want to? No, but it was, it was cool, it was cool. UN's going against Israel now. Yeah, they are. And one of the things that was neat, this was wild, okay? He takes us up over here somewhere. Syria's up here. And he takes us in this old building. And it's like three or four stories. It was an old hospital. Downstairs was the hospital. The next level was the bomb-making factory and the, ro the rocket factory. The next level was the police. The next level was the, I don't know, secret police or something. And in the war, that place was bombed out. So there's holes this big around in the walls, and the stairs are exploded, and he just walks us right in. If we were in America, it would say, condemn, do not go here, right? But he's like, come on in, let me show you around. So we go around, and we're just walking in this old, dilapidated building that looked like it could fall apart at any moment. I mean, you walk up the stairs, you look over, there's a hole. It's just like four feet across, straight down, you look down. I mean, you could, there's no, the railings on the stairs were gone. They were metal. Someone cut them for the red. You could have fallen. And he takes us all the way up to the top. And we're at the top. And I'm looking down. And it's crumbling in places. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, this wasn't too smart, was it? But, but God protected us. And he's saying, over there is the border of Syria. And this used to belong to Syria. Now Israel owns it. But he's showing us there's the border of Syria. And right there is a UN. Uh, I don't even know what it's called. But they patrol the border. So it's like they're in no land's land, the UN, and they're watching to make sure nothing happens. But uh, I don't know what time it was, Does but... that make the, the UN good then? Yeah, people think the UN is great because they're... But one time they were attacked by Syria, or it was Lebanon, I can't so remember which country. Protecting Israel, they're supposed to be. Well, they're... He said they're not. What is the word? They're patrolling and they're, they're supposed to be the guy that goes, hey, cut it out, don't fight. But yet they let some fight when they... You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like they, when they feel like it type of thing. Yeah. But one of those countries came in and took over the UN, the place, and held them captive. And they were all, I don't know where they, what country. It was a certain country they were all from that were in that area. And the guy that was the head of that country said, you give them back now and I'll pay you. And he paid for them to give back his people that they were keeping. Well, that's all they want. They want more money so they can build more rockets. But they even took over the UN place because they just want more rockets to blow up and hurt more people. Isn't that sad? But it was interesting to see them there. And they were just in the middle. And oh, as we're driving up here, and we went to Baneas, which used to be called Paneas. And that's where this huge cave is that they call the gates of hell. Remember that? And that's where Jesus went. And, and he says, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay. We were going there and as we're driving through, we keep looking on the left and there's this wire and there's this little yellow sign. And finally the guy in the back goes, what's that yellow sign? He goes, well, let me show you. It says landmines. <laughs> so there are still landmines there. And so don't go there, basically. You know, don't come there from Lebanon and don't go. That's just open land that there's landmines in still to this day. I was like, wow, wouldn't it be fun to throw rocks over there and see what happens? No, but that was kind of interesting to see landmines and things like that still there. Crazy, man. But it was pretty neat to see the ruins. That, to me, was the coolest place. Now, I guess I'll finish with this. We went to a place 
It's called Scathopolis or something like that. It's one of the 10 cities that Jesus went to in his ministry. That's called the Decapolis. You've ever heard of that? And so he went to 10 different cities preaching. This is one of those cities. I'm drawing a blank on the name of the city right now in the Old Testament. But it was a Philistine city in the Old Testament. And when the Philistines beat King Saul and they killed King Saul, well, he killed himself, and they killed Jonathan, they took Jonathan's body and King Saul's body and they put it on the, on the wall. And then it was the Gibeonites or somebody, I forget, that came at the night and they took down his body and they took and buried it. So it's that city. But that was in the time of Saul. Years later, that city was built up again by the Romans. And that city is one of the best that they've found as far as the ruins. And you could walk through that and feel like what it was to live in the time of Jesus. And Jesus would have gone there and preached to them. And the, the main road of these old towns is called Cardo. What does that make you think of? Heart. So that was the heart of the city, the main road. And on either side, they had people selling stuff. So you got to walk down and just look at this city just like it was in the time of Jesus. And it had this beautiful big theater and carved out of the side of the wall and this arch. And what is that called? Oh, where our word vomit comes from. <laughs> you walk into the theater and that archway that you walk in, that's called the vomitorium. Because as soon as it was over, everybody ran out as fast as they could. They spewed out, if you will. <laughs> so that's where our word vomit comes from. I thought that because they're all running out to go pee. Because they've been sitting in there so long watching this. I got to go pee. And they're all running out. So that's the vomitorium. But I got to go in and see that. And man, they were so smart. When you stand down there, the way that it's set up, your voice carries. You could be way up here sitting and you hear like you're right there, right next to them. And we got to see all that. And it was just really, really cool. And just to think that Jesus would have been in that city was just, wow, just fascinating. And preaching to them. And every city had their false god that they worshipped. So this one wasn't Ishtar. It was some other woman. I forget her name. But you walk down that main street, and then it begins to curve. And right there was a platform where they would have worshipped her and her statue. So I wonder if Jesus went over there and went, zip, sh and peed on it. You know? No, I'm just kidding. No, he probably didn't pee on the statue. But he probably went over there and said, Wicked, wicked lady, you know, this is falsehoods or whatever. And he would have preached against the woman of the city. But just to think, wow, Jesus was there. It was really cool. And not far from there was the place where they had gladiators. And we got to see the gladiator thing. And just think, all these people died right there for stupidity. Just so somebody can cheer somebody on. It was just so sad. So sad. But anyway... It was pretty neat. I like old ruins, and I really loved walking through there and seeing all that. That was really cool. Really cool. Anyway, anybody else? Or are we done? All right. That was the trip to Israel. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you in prayer. We thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. And Lord, where do you sent me? And God, may it encourage people to remember to pray that you come soon and uh, encourage them to read their Bible. And Lord, to pray for Israel. Lord, we just pray that you'd... Um, Save the souls of those people over there, God. And uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Kenneth, Lord, that you'd help him as he's going to the doctor and the test that he's receiving. Please help him. Uh, we pray for all the other needs, Lord, that we have. And uh, we just pray, though, most, most assuredly and, and most uh, dogmatically, Lord, we just beg you, Lord, please come back and take us home. And uh, until you do, please keep us safe tomorrow. And uh, Lord, no matter what comes, we know you're with us, but please help us to be the light that we should be in this world of darkness. Thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.